Hey, you geeks. Words of Radiance, also known as Why I Spaced Out During the Easter Vigil. Since then, I've reread it three times and finally have a handle on why I like this book. Besides, of course, the happy fault of a broken soul, which merits us nights most radiant. Now that I'm part of the fandom, I've realized that most people don't read these books in four days. Some of you even take months. How? I found that I like books like I like beer. I'll ingest practically anything, but my speed and repetition indicate my actual enjoyment. So four readings in a little over a month, true quarantine inflated that number, but it's fair to say that I really like this book. It avoids the common pitfall of Sanderson's other sequels, namely leaving the original crew behind in favor of a new cast, which is great because there's only one member of Bridge Four that I am willing to part with. This book has some of the greatest scenes in the archive, scenes that I've craved since Kaladin got strung up in the storm, but also has the worst. Not that they're poorly written, no. Sanderson intentionally wrote them to rip your heart out and scream in agony as your favorite characters do things that are monumentally stupid, yet understandable. Words of Radiance takes the next necessary step in the archive and makes things complicated. While all the characters are charted for eventual collision, each makes their own way in practical isolation. It's the sort of story that could really annoy me, yet doesn't, usually. I did mention the part that I yell at this book repeatedly, right? So if you haven't read it yet, buckle up. You've got a big storm coming. Spoiler review, part one. Characters. So many characters. More viewpoints, character arcs, and just more. How did Sanderson squeeze them in? I'll try my best to keep this manageable, but there's gonna be a part two. Shallan. It takes a special kind of book to take a reasonably competent young woman and transform her into a mentally unstable lump of dithering emotions and call that character development. Yet, it works. Shallan's madness is her brilliance. This is either madness or brilliance. It's remarkable how often those two traits coincide. We see her backstory, and I'm struck by just how messed up it is. At first glance, she killed her mother in pure self-defense and her father in, well, the battered woman defense that borderlines on premeditated murder. You'd think that the murder would weigh her down more, but no, it's the death of her mother. Of course, she didn't receive any sort of counseling afterward and was just told to pretend it never happened, which she did to her detriment. Then she got to watch as the truth destroyed her father and through him her family. When push comes to shove, I will kill your friends and family to remind you of my love. Now, I can scrounge a little drop of empathy for her father. Seeing your wife try to kill your child because your wife believes the child is demonic, only for said child to summon a shard blade and stab the woman would not be easy for any person. Yet he went about dealing with this traumatic event in the worst way possible. And it got him killed. As for Shallan in the present, I liked her Dorothy-esque way of picking up strays and taking them off to the Shattered Plains. Oh, we're off to see the wizard, the wonderful wizard of Oz. 
It even helps Kaladin. Also, her spying and illusion skills make her unique amongst most fair maidens of fantasy. Yet, she has really bad role models in this. First Tin, then the biker gang Ghostbloods. Not exactly the most sane or noble lot. Given Shallan's wayward character development, I don't see this ending particularly well. Kaladin. Let's see if you've heard this one. A person of the lowest social class becomes the bodyguard for the most important person in their country. While dealing with the stress of their new job, they are corrupted by by someone they believe to be their friend, which leads them to abandon their ideals and attempt an assassination. Yeah, as Witt says, all stories have been told before, it's just the names that change. But this art works better in this story than it did for Vin. Kaladin's Maximus Ben-Hur style character arc is the type who naturally demands vengeance. Father to a murdered son, husband to a murdered wife, and I will have my vengeance in this life or the next. Yet, his honor allows him to overcome it. Eventually. First, we see that Kaladin really doesn't know what friendship is. Kaladin believes that all the bridgemen treat him like a herald when all they do is treat him with common decency. So when Melash treats him with conceit, he views that as friendly familiarity. Friends don't kill other friends spren. Syl's death was particularly hard as without her, Cal's chapters were just doom and gloom. I'd say that her death was 90% Kaladin's, 5% Dalinar, 5% Alakar, and 100% Moash's fault. When Kaladin finally stands up to Moash, swears to the ideal, and gets his shard blade, that scene is just chills. It is only topped by him landing on the plateau in time to save Dalinar. I only wish that Sanderson characters weren't quite so stoic. Adolin. Like Kaladin, he learns that he has Terrible taste in friends. An extension of his ability to notice things that others don't and make the exact wrong decision. Know that there's something off about Kaladin, the man who saved his life, decides to be a complete jerk. Knows that there's something off about Yakimov, doubles down on their friendship and is shocked. Shocked when he is betrayed. The only person who is immune from his perception is Shalon. Or maybe he sees her sincerity through her front. We the readers know that she actually likes him, so even though she is over-eager, there's a nugget of truth in it. Yet, for all of his buffoonery, Adolin comes around and stands by Kaladin during his imprisonment. Although, we don't find out about that until it's over. If Kaladin hadn't been sulking the whole time, he could have sent Syl to investigate, and he wouldn't have felt so alone. Adolin is also the first to figure out that Kaladin is a surge binder. True, he doesn't have the right words for it, but he knows something's up. Beating out even Dalinar, the guy who is supposed to be uniting the Knights Radiant. Dalinar. What were you thinking? Seriously, Sanderson gives him very little POV in this book, and yet his communication, or lack thereof, with Kaladin fuels the conflict between the two for the first half of the book. What we've got here is... Failure to communicate. Despite saying he trusts Kaladin, he doesn't tell him what goes on during High Storms. He doesn't tell him that he followed up on Kaladin's accusations against Amaran until Kaladin is in storming prison. And even then he doesn't let him know that Adolin is a few cells down or that the investigation remains ongoing. 
No, he's just stoic and unreadable and stuff. Now, I've never been in the army, but I've had professors whose stated goal was to make students break during class. And break us, they did. Yet even they were more approachable than Dalinar was in this book. Maybe he had good reasons. He was ruling the nation at the time. But he done goofed when choosing Amaran to restart the Knight's Radiance. The man hated by 66% of the Lethe Surge Binders. Maybe he was blinded by Amaran's glowing reputation. I will sparkle like a wealthy woman's neck. But it took Amaran refusing to defend Adolin in the arena in the name of the Radiance for Dalinar to start to see the truth. Of course, the reader realizes exactly how ridiculous Amaran's claim is when 100% of Alethi Surgebinders fought for Adolin in the arena. I still like Dalinar and think he has potential to be a great leader of the Knights Radiant, but he ain't there yet. Shipping. Ah, the Sanderson love triangle. Kaladin, Adolin, and Shallan. I must say that the older I get, the less empathy I have for love triangles where the linchpin is a woman who can't make up her mind. Now, Shallan is barely a woman and her mind isn't quite stable, so there's some leeway. But she actually seems to like Adolin and he actually seems to like her. She was honest, though guarded, with him in the wine garden and he was honest with her. Meanwhile, Kaladin and Shallan just don't quite fit my criteria for antagonists to lovers. They could, but they'd both have to strive to overcome their character flaws to grow into a healthy relationship. And I'm not certain Kaladin can overcome the small problem that he killed her brother. Even if Shallan can come to peace with that, They've both got so much work to do before they could be healthy. And why would they when Shallan already has something healthy with Adolin? Part two will cover world building, magic system, interludes, and plot. See you next week. Thank you for watching. Please like, share, and subscribe if you would like to see more. Your patronage is greatly appreciated.